Hello and welcome to Carmelite Conversations. This is Frances Harry. I hope you're having a blessed day. Recently, I heard a secular discount Carmelite give a presentation called Courage in the Face of Opposition with the subtitle, What the Carmelites Can Teach Us About Living Counterculturally. Now that really caught my attention since you know we're living in a time of great political and societal strife added to the COVID-19 virus pandemic that we're going through. It's a challenging period to say the least. So this presentation that was given was so helpful that I begged the presenter to come and have a Carmelite conversation with me because I wanted you to hear what she had to tell us. Her name is Colleen Solinger. She's the director of formation and member of the Secular Discount Carmelite community of our Mother of Good Council in Dayton, Ohio. And so it is with great joy that I welcome Colleen Solinger to the program. Hello, Colleen. Hello, Francis. Thank you for having me on. Oh, I'm so glad that you were able to make time to have this conversation because what you uh, presented earlier was so rich. I just wanted everybody to be able to hear it. And I know you've been a guest with our program in years past. And um, so we're glad to get this going again. And um, I think we're gonna try to make a little bit of a series on this topic. So today you have much, much to tell us. Um, but uh, before we start, uh, Colleen, I always like to start with an opening prayer. Um, and this one comes from St. Teresa of Avila, Holy Mother Teresa. Um, it's from her letters. It's letter number 40. And it's just part of that letter that I want to use as the opening prayer. And then the, the remainder will be our closing prayer. I think it will really help us uh, frame what we're going to talk about today. So let's get recollected and let us sign ourselves in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord God of hosts, you said in your gospel, I am not come to bring peace, but the sword. Provide me then with strength and weapons for the battle. I burn with desire to fight for your glory, but I beseech you, strengthen my courage. Then with holy King David, I can exclaim, you alone are my shield, O God. It is you who prepare my hands for war. In the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Of course, we know that we're not talking about guns here. <laughs> right. We're talking about the weapons in the spiritual life, like prayer and fasting. So, Colleen, I know you're going to give us a lot more ideas. So, uh, without further ado, uh, let us let you uh, begin to instruct us on how to have courage in the face of opposition. <laughs> This is good. Well, well, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at Carmelites who are alive during times that were challenging for those living the Catholic faith. Um, we'll look at a bit at the struggles they face, the ways they remain faithful, and what those of us living in the 21st century can learn from them. Um, but before I go into their stories, I'm going to go ahead and give you the answer to what it is that they teach us about living counterculturally. Um, it's comes from what you were just talking about, you know, the, the prayer, the fasting, it's the liturgical living. Um, they teach us to put God first. They teach us that prayer should be as essential to us as air and water. They teach us to live the faith unapologetically. Okay, now I just want you to repeat that first because these are really great points and I don't want anybody to miss them. So if you would repeat that, please. Right, put God first. Prayer is essential to your life and live the faith unapologetically. All right, great, thank you. All right, um, C.S. Lewis wrote, prayer doesn't change God, it changes me. Mm. And I, I love that. If, if you're seeking God above all through prayer, it will stop mattering to you whether the culture supports you or not in living your faith unapologetically. Um, the more aligned you are to God, the less important exterior circumstances become. And that's what we're gonna see with these Carmelites. Um, I, I feel like it is, obviously it's a very Catholic way to be, people who are 
you know, on, on this, the path, but particularly the Carmelites. There's just something about the way they just get this right. So what I'd like to do is first tell you about a couple of saints and then some Carmelites who are not yet recognized as saints. Okay, great. Well, let us begin then. All right. So first, of course, St. Teresa of Avila, um, just briefly because, you know, she, she wrote books. <laughs> we could go on and on for a long time about obstacles that she faced. Um, some of them were within the church. Some came from civil authorities, specifically for her. Um, her writings caught the attention of the Spanish Inquisition, but Teresa was never afraid. This is what she had to say about that situation. This comes from the book of her life. I said they shouldn't be afraid about these possible accusations, that it would be pretty bad for my soul if there were something of it, in it, of the sort that I should have to fear the Inquisition. That I thought that if I did have something to fear, I'd go myself to seek out the Inquisitors, and that if I were accused, the Lord would free me and I would be the one to gain. Mm, how wise. Yeah, and, I, you know, I, that was a, a really big deal. I mean, somebody submitted uh, her books to them. And so uh, a lot of people would like run away at that time. But, uh, you know, when you are confident that God is going to take care of you and that he's directing you, you, you want to be corrected if you're wrong. And uh, other than that, you want to speak the truth. And mm -hmm. I know truth was uh, fundamental to everything that Teresa of Avila was writing about. Um, right. And I would say and that living unapologetically, it absolutely came from her prayer life, um, which wasn't always perfect and easy and rosy. And we know she went through aridity and yet she was faithful to it. And this is the result. She did not even fear the Inquisition. <laughs> All right, great. Thank you for that on mm -hmm. Holy Mother Teresa. Right. All right. St. John of the Cross, our other big one. Yeah. Um, he dealt with persecution over the way he tried to live out his faith. For his part in the reform of the Carmelite order, he was kidnapped by fellow Carmelites and held prisoner in a monastery. Um, he was in a six by 10 foot cell, minimal food, no change of clothing. But that time was also one of great closeness with God. Deprived from the natural world that he loved, he loved to pray in the outdoors. He still used the images of the natural world and humanly loved to describe how his soul seeks and finds God. Um, what I did is I've taken a bit of um, poetry here that was inspired during his captivity. So keep in mind, he's in captivity and this is where his heart is going. Reveal your presence and may the vision of your beauty be my death. For the sickness of love is not cured except by your very presence and image. Now I occupy my soul and all my energies in his service. I no longer tend the herd, nor have I any other work, now that my very every act is love. Um, you know, but occupying. Which, oh, go ahead. I was going to ask which, do you remember which poem this comes from? Is this from Spiritual Canticle? It is, yes. I was, okay. yeah, it is. I should have said that at the beginning. Okay, I, I, I thought I recognized it. And, you know, the other thing about him being in this prison at this time, I mean, he had a great deal of suffering because of being in the cell and it was dark. But on top of that, he had also, they would go in there and scourge him and, they would, and yeah. uh, uh, you know, not feed him. So uh, to think that in the midst of this, you would, you'd almost think of it like, because he was there nine months, that mm -hmm. it was like he was being birthed. And this was the womb from which sprung forth this, some of these beautiful works of his and uh, spiritual canticle being uh, a major work. So uh, what a blessing that is. It is. It's very beautiful. Yeah, I, I love that whole nine months thing. It's <laughs> it, and, and that, yes, that is what was birthed. Um, he talks about occupying our soul and all our energies in God's service is what we need to be doing. And this is whether you're in the circumstances he was in or not, whether we're sitting before the blessed sacrament or we're waiting our turn at the post office. And importantly, it's whether society is supporting us in our faith or whether it is not. You know, we've had a lot of Carmelites that have suffered some kind of imprisonment. Um, and I know you're probably going to bring up a few. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think it's important for us to recall that no matter our circumstances, like you said, wherever we're at, whether in good times or bad, 
in sickness or health, that we need to be in God, with God, and through God, um, and and trust that that He'll get us through, or um, that the situation we're in will help us to grow in our love and our virtues. Um, and um, it, it is challenging now uh, for many people who have been locked in because of the pandemic. They, mm-hmm. they feel imprisoned in a sense. So a Carmelite would take that sense of imprisonment and make it their solitary cell where they can be intimate with God in prayer. So we can make it a good. Right. And not only for our own growth, but also for the growth of others, because that is certainly what Carmelites have also done over the time. Um, can I use this as a segue then into our ne- the next group I'd like to talk about? Because these are people who absolutely did offer for the, what they were suffering for others. And that would be the martyrs of Compiègne. They're well known beyond Carmelite circles for having paid the price of their lives during the French Revolution. Um, It's a martyrdom which is said to have brought about the end of the reign of terror for it ended just 10 days after, I think it was 10 days after they were martyred. Um, These were women from whom everything had been taken. And yes, they were terrified. Um, One of the sisters was said to have gone into uncontrollable shakes when she tried to even say the word guillotine. Um, Another one actually fainted when their death sentences were read out. So very real. They, They knew what was happening. They were frightened. But during their ordeal, they maintained their daily prayer routines. Despite imprisonment, they carried on with the novena leading up to the Feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Um, on the eve of their trial, and the trial was on the feast day of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, um, a Sister Julie, she's the one who couldn't pronounce the word guillotine without fear, she penned a five stanza parody of the French revolutionary song that was to become the national anthem, the Marseillaise. And in this rewriting, the Carmelites embraced the notion of abandoning themselves to God for God's victory. In the extreme situation of facing death for their faith, These women were at the same time choosing to offer the terror as an act of oblation for others. Um, Sister Julie wrote to her mother, we are victims of our century and we must sacrifice ourselves that it be reconciled to God. An eternity of happiness awaits me. The storm rages today, but tomorrow we shall reach the harbor. Wow, that is very potent. And I recall seeing an opera about these martyrs and it was very touching. So I recommend that highly. And I know there are some novels and um, other uh, books written on this um, and they are great witnesses for living the faith. You know, just to think that in the midst of uh, facing the guillotine, guillotine, they will not budge from their faith. Mm -hmm. That really says a lot, doesn't it? It does. And again, and thinking of others on the way there too, you know, offering it up for their country. And that's just so beautiful. And again, I I just want to reiterate that they were still scared at the same time. It's not necessarily going to take away our fear when we're surrendering to God, but it gives us the courage to continue to do it and to continue offering it up. And plus, um, it helps us to remember we should set our eyes on Christ and heaven. Mm-hmm. That heaven is coming, and that's where we should aim to be. Uh, don't aim for purgatory, I say, because you might miss it. Aim for heaven, because if you miss, you got to fail safe from purgatory, right? But no, exactly. heaven is where God wants us. So why wouldn't we aim for where God wants us? And our blessed mother wants all of our children with her, right? So um, aim for heaven. All right, so, you know, as we're talking about French people, (laughs) that leads into our next Carmelite, right? It does. Saint Elizabeth of the Trinity. Now, she was born almost 100 years after the reign of of terror, but civil France had not yet resolved its conflicts with the church. Um, She lived during a time when the government was once again of an anti-clerical bent. In her letters... Um, which is something you can find in volume two of the complete works published by ICS. She makes a number of references to living under the tensions of a secular government that was hostile towards religion. Uh, In one example, her community needed to appeal to the authorities to allow them to stay in their convent in Dijon. As they awaited the decision, they lived with the possibility that they would be exiled. Uh, Paintings and statues from the convent were loaned out to trusted members of the community for safekeeping. 
Uh, at one point, St. Elizabeth wrote a letter to her mother asking her to send a dress pattern so that she would be able to make clothing to have in the event of a forced exile because she wouldn't have been able to wear her um, religious habit. Uh, that letter was written in 1902. So a couple of years later in 1904, there's another letter where she wants to soothe her mother's worries about escalating tensions. And this is what she wrote to her. We are completely at peace. Set your mind at rest about that. Mm. Um, the reason for her peace was her constant prayer. Uh, again, she too was praying for her country. She wrote this in a different letter. Poor France, I love to cover her with the blood of the just one, of him who is always living to intercede and ask mercy. Um, she too was very aware that things weren't perfect. She wrote in, um, oh, I didn't write down the year of this letter. I'm sorry. This was before um, pleading for her country, a few years before that. Yes, the future is very dark. And don't you feel the need to love much in order to make reparation? Let us make a solitary place for him in the innermost part of our soul and remain there with him. Nothing will be able to rob us of this interior cell, no matter what trials we undergo. I carry my one treasure inside me and all the rest is nothing. You know, we can almost just say those words for our country here in the United States today, couldn't we? In yeah, 2021, uh, crazy stuff is going on. And we, um, we too join with St. Elizabeth of the Trinity in praying um, for our country and, um, Carrying the treasure inside us, how important that is um, at this time and all times, of course. Right. All right. Well, and as I would say, as you were pointing out, you know, that our, our end goal is heaven. If you look at it, the martyrs of Compiègne did end up martyrs. St. Elizabeth of the Trinity did not. They were able to stay. She died of, you know, disease. It wasn't a, a, a disease, I believe. Addison's disease, right. So they were both paying, praying for their country. They both got different answers to that but it, it just shows though that it's it's in the end though aren't they all recognized as saints and and that is our goal and so I, we don't know how our prayers are going to turn out but we see how theirs turned out in the big picture in the end and how important it is to think that they weren't just praying for themselves and their families but for their countries right and um so what a good example that is for us you know, to, to reach out and our prayers are covering the whole wide world. I always think of uh, doing a double dip. You dip the whole world in the precious blood of Jesus, and then you dip it in the ocean of his divine mercy. <laughs> so I go, try to do my double dip. <laughs> I got this thing with God. I'm like, if I just do two little nudges with my hand, uh, that's, that's my double dip motion. And, and he knows I'm praying, you know, <laughs> so I know it's, it's little, but you know, God understands us. And he, he, uh, he, I think is, uh, appreciative of our, of our meager efforts because, uh, Jesus can take our meagerness and make them wealth. So. Right. All right. Very good. All right, the next saint is St. Maria Maravillas. She was Spanish. She lived between 1891 and 1974. And while we could talk about her entire life in another <laughs> um, talk altogether, um, what I'd like to talk about now is how she suffered physical deprivation and the loss of religious liberty during the Spanish Civil War. Now, throughout the war, Mother Maravillas, as Priorist was known for caring for her daughters with a nurturing motherly love and an affable personality. From everything from her arrest by the authorities to interrogation at gunpoint by revolutionaries to her strength in rebuilding a damaged convent, she was known to project a serenity, a real grace under pressure. And again, where did this come from? It's no mystery. <laughs> she had a lot to say about fidelity and faith. She wrote in a letter, do not be afraid if you are faithful, and I trust the Lord that you will be. Nothing can be taken away from you that he has given you. Obviously, she had have, <laughs> she, she has suffered material deprivation. We know what she means by they won't take away what God has given you. Um, 
during her interrogation at gunpoint, she never tried to hide the fact that she was a religious living in a, with fellow Carmelites in an apartment in Madrid after they had been um, kicked out of their convent. When they demanded to know why she wasn't afraid of people who had the power to kill her, her calm response was, we have no fear. On the contrary, we want to be able to give our lives for the Lord. In the midst of danger and the real threat of imminent martyrdom, the community faithfully carried on the life that they would have been living inside the cloister walls. In that apartment in Madrid, the Blessed Sacrament was reserved in the tabernacle. Um, mass and feasts were celebrated. In fact, numerous locals knew about them and came to the small apartment to receive Holy Communion and to pray with them. And she once wrote, what the Lord does in souls who are faithful to him. And we're so blessed that in Carmel, we have lots of writings that we can learn about what God is doing in the souls that are faithful to him. Mm -hmm. And it is interesting that we have so many examples of those who faced martyrdom um, and kept on with their daily routine in spite of it or, or did the best that they could in the situation that they were in. But again, always grounded on the prayer and um, putting God first and living the faith un unapologetically, like those three points that you said. Mm -hmm. All right. So now I know you're going to lead into another famous martyr, yes. uh, Carmelite <laughs> saint. Again, you'll say, you're, you can't do this woman justice in just a couple of minutes. And we can't, but we're going to try. <laughs> well, we're just going to give a snippet to entice people to look into her life, right? Exactly. Well, this brings us to St. Teresa Benedict of the Cross, otherwise known as St. Edith Stein. She wasn't sent to Auschwitz because of her Catholic faith, but rather her Jewish birth. She was arrested in 1942, along with the remaining known Jews in the Netherlands. Yet, it was undoubtedly her Carmelite mindset that gave her strength during her ordeal. A dozen years before her death, she shared this thought. Only in confidential relationship with the Lord in the tabernacle can one forget self, become free of all one's wishes and pretenses, pretensions, I'm sorry, let me do this again. Only in daily confidential relationship with the Lord in the tabernacle can one forget oneself, become free of all one's wishes and pretensions, and have a heart open to all the needs and wants of others. She lived this. We know from letters that she wrote from camps on her way to Auschwitz, she was trying to reach back to her sisters in that she left behind to know that she was offering her sufferings for the conversion of unbelievers, for the Jews, for her persecutors, and this is a quote directly from her, for all who had lost God from their hearts. Mm. Um, her first stop after her arrest by the Gestapo found her with her, her blood sister and fellow Carmelite, as well as with sisters from other religious communities. They gathered together to pray the divine office and the rosary. Um, and a and witness that was, in, that was in the camp, right? When they yeah, were it was yeah, it was it was before she got to Auschwitz. There were a few stops that she made, but this was yeah. So this was like the very first stop in their oh, okay. arrest. Okay. And yeah. um, a witness said Edith Stein was considered by all as their superior, since the strength emanating from her quiet being was unmistakable. Wow. She has so much to teach us. I mean, she was a philosopher. And um, she wrote a lot um, about women, about education. Um, she taught a lot. Um, there's so much um, that she has written. I think there are like 11 books there are, <laughs> that, I know. When publications I... <laughs> that deal with her. It could be more now, but <laughs> I, I have a, a large collection on her. And uh, I, I know we, we're just giving a tease here, a snippet, but uh, you know, she has much to offer us as far as how to live in the face of opposition. And I know the story, the famous story in my mind is um, people talking about how in the midst of the um, of Auschwitz, uh, she was the mothers who had children there with them. You know, they were so upset that they just forgot about their children. And and uh, St. Teresa Benedicta was there, you know, combing the, the little girl's hairs and yeah. comforting them and 
speaking with them. And uh, I'm just like, oh my gosh, it just tears your heart. So um, such a beautiful story. I love that. Yeah. It reminds me of that quote of St. John the Cross, where there is no love, put love and you will find love. Exactly. All right, let's go on then. All right. What we're going to do now is shift gears and talk about the lives of two Carmelites who are not recognized saints. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> They're on their way. <laughs> They're on their way. Um, Père Jacques of Jesus. He was um, alive in between 1900 and 1945, and his cause for canonization was opened in April of 1997. He was born in France, known as Lucien Bunel, until he be entered Carmel when he became Père Jacques of Jesus. He's best known for his heroism in the French resistance, having harbored Jews when he was working as the head of a Carmelite school for boys during the German occupation of France. His story is known beyond Carmel and even beyond Catholic circles because of this, it was the subject of the French film um, from 1987, Au Bois les Enfants, which translates as goodbye children. The last words he said to his students as he was being arrested. Um, I saw this movie when it was first out and I, I just love that it, this was long before I knew I'd have a call to Carmel or that one day I'd be reading the words of the real life priest who inspired the character in this movie. Amazing, huh? It is. So I'd like to share a few quotes from Père Jacques before I tell the story of his persecution so that you can understand where his heart was as France and the world were being plunged into war. Now, as, as you get to these, I, I want our listeners to be thinking about, you know, who knows if we're on the verge of a war. So let's listen to these as, as, for today in our lives today. OK. OK. All right. He was conscripted into the army at the beginning of World War II, then later released to return to his school after the German occupation of France. During this time of his conscription, he published a newspaper for his fellow soldiers. In one issue written in 1940, he addressed the topic of how one should live during war. He said, the art of living the war has two principles. This is his quote, living the war humanly and so live it as to become more human. Now, what did he mean by this? Among other things, he exhorted men to quote, radiate intellectual curiosity and the outlook of a lover of beauty, end quote. Um, from the witness of camp survivors, it's clear that Père Jacques lived this philosophy when he was imprisoned. Um, he also shared the belief, this was again from the newsletter at the beginning of the war, he shared his belief that if you have nothing else, you can listen to the songs of the wind and contemplate the light of day. So, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of John of the Cross there. Yes. <laughs> he had a little bitty window that was way up high, but there he could listen to the songs of the wind and contemplate the light of day. And from that prayer and that contemplation of God through nature, uh, even though it was just a teeny bitty window, um, still inspired him with these great works of poetry and commentary that, that were so meaningful. So, you know, anytime we're in a situation, um, I remember I had a situation where um, there was a, a live shooter drill that be, actually became a real thing, a real event. And I was hidden with 10 other people in this really long closet um, while they were trying to find where this shooter could be. And, and we thought he was in the room next to us and we, cause we heard shots, you know, and so for me, it was a very serious, serious moment. And um, so to, to, you know, if you think about being in a situation in advance, you know, what that would be like. I remember thinking, I wonder what it's like for these people when they're in these situations. And then I found myself in it. We're there. And, yeah. and so it, it's important for us to think about, you know, well, our go to, of course, is prayer. All right. Um, and knowing that that God is with you in this moment, and um, even if if you're imprisoned and you can't get out, um, we can still traverse all the rooms of the interior castle that Saint Teresa of Avila teaches us. Just, even though you may be restrained physically, maybe you're sick in bed with COVID. Um, 
that even though you're restrained physically, that your mind can still uh, go out into nature and your memory and and see God's beauty in that way. All right, um, sorry to interrupt there, but no, it, was, was I was excited all of a sudden and reminded about that experience. <laughs> right, and it fits well. Um, so um, we were talking about living the war human. Right. Right. So, and yeah, another way, according to Per Jacques, another way of living the war humanly was to know that it is useless to worry and to be sad. Sadness does not change a situation except to increase its pain. Simply take each day as it comes with its own share of sadness and joy. Do not try to guess what tomorrow will bring and do not fall into fear. Okay. Those are his words, by the way, not mine. Yeah. You got to you gotta say that quote again, because that's so applicable today, where fear seems to be so rampant in so many people's lives. Let's, let's hear what he said again. Right. So again, know that these are his words. Know that it is useless to worry and to be sad. Sadness does not change a situation except to increase its pain. Simply take each day as it comes and with its own share of sadness and joy. Do not try to guess what tomorrow will bring and do not fall into fear. Okay, that's something that we could actually take to prayer and really analyze our life. Um, I know that one who trusts God um, does not fear, but if you're fearful, then it's showing a lack of trust in God. I think that comes from St. Faustina, but also St. Therese of Lisieux was talking about that a lot. So, yeah. All right, go ahead. All right, so as a member of the resistance, Perjac used his school to shelter Jews. He took on three boys as students of the school, sheltering the father of one of those boys in a home in the village. And he also placed, there was a Jewish botanist and he used, he, he was, put him on staff as a teacher. He also employed another Jewish, Jewish boy as a worker at the school. Um, in January of 1944, acting on a tip, the Gestapo raided the school. Perjac and the Jewish students and teacher were arrested. Uh, the students and the teacher were sent to Auschwitz where they were executed pretty much straight away. Perjac, however, was imprisoned in various work camps before ending up in Mauthausen in Austria. Now, throughout his experience in the camp, he was always offering his service to others. Sometimes this meant priestly duties. Um, whereas most priests had been sent to Dachau, Perjac tried to fly below the radar. He didn't want them to, to he didn't want to, want to expose himself as a priest so that he would be able to continue to minister to the fellow prisoners in the places where the priests were being removed. So um, at other times, his service meant... Um, it wasn't his strictly priestly duties. It was, um, he, he served by cleaning the infirmary. He took care, care of the physical needs of the sick, not just the spiritual needs. Um, now, Perjac barely survived his experience in the camp. Shortly after it was liberated by American troops, he was diagnosed with advanced tuberculosis and died a few weeks later. But in the last days of his life, he shared this with the priest who was ministering to him. And again, this is a quote from him. We must be happy to do the will of God right up to the end and to give up our life if asked, for perhaps that is our calling. Wow. And so, you know, I often ponder how is it that, um, like with Holy Mother Teresa, when she was young, it was her desire to become a martyr. Um, and she and her brother were going to run away um, into the, uh, the area of the um, Muslims at that time. Uh, and hope to be uh, beheaded by them so yeah. as to be a martyr for God and get to heaven to be mm -hmm. to be with God um, but you know we we have to face death it, it does come and of course with COVID a lot of people are thinking about this so uh, I think all of these um, nuggets of wisdom about facing death facing opposition are very important for us to consider when we're not in a, a terrible situation so that we can prepare so that we say like, if I were ever in that situation, this is what I would do. And then think about what Colleen has told us <laughs> about the, what the Carmelites have shared and experienced. And um, we will find ourselves in a better place and we'll be able to serve the others. And, and that service to others is, you know, uh, love, uh, love of God through love of neighbor, right? Right. 
yeah um, exactly all right i know you have another uh person to introduce to us and and most of our listeners may not have heard of him so i'm really glad you're going to introduce us to him and i know we're only going to have an, a, a little bit on him but i um we're going to try to continue this series and do another talk on him but but i know today you're going to tease us with, with some of the great wisdom from this next carmelite yes this would be General Louis Gaston de Sonis. I'll spell it S-O-N-I-S. -S. Sorry to my French teachers. Francis and I decided to pronounce it like that so it's easier for people to understand how we're saying it, S-O-N-I-S. -S. He was alive between 1825 and 1887. He was a husband, a father of 12, a military officer, and a member of the secular order of Discalced Carmelites. Uh, many anecdotes exist illustrating his devotion as a husband and father. Also, stories expressing his worries about being able to meet the temporal needs of his family, but knowing that virtue is more important. Uh, this, this kicked in especially at the end of his career with twofold suffering of ill health and environment increasingly hostile towards Catholics. Um, did I mention, no, I didn't, when I was giving <laughs> his little bio, he was French, <laughs> um, living in the time just a little bit before St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. Okay. Um, he wrote, I must sacrifice our comfort to my honor as a Christian. Um, his life experiences were not different from any other man who even today strives to do his best at work and also provide for his family. In both his professional and his personal life, he was known to be a man of integrity. And the starting point of everything he did was his relationship with God and his life of prayer. And this is what you need to know in understanding how he displayed courage in the yeah, face of opposition. Before you get to that, I just want to point out, so this is a general. This mm -hmm. is the army, right? Yes, the French uh, army. And I know in Dayton, Ohio, we have the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. So we right. have a lot of military people around here. So this really strikes a chord to hear about how someone can live in the military and yet stay solidly uh, Catholic and uh, live uh, Catholic values and continue uh, the life of prayer in the midst of even uh, an active battle. Exactly. During his career, he faced difficulties as a practicing Catholic in a nation and culture increasingly hostile towards the church. Mm -hmm. um, the French president, towards the end of his, his um, towards the end of the general's career. The French president knew that he earned the respect of those who worked with him because he was a person of integrity and the president was courteous towards Dissonese, but because he was a Catholic, a practicing Catholic, the president also had an agent spy on his activities. <laughs> um, now this was a time when they used the word clerical as a derogatory term, but Dissonese said that he glories at the appellation of clerical. He likes and being called clerical. <laughs> liked being called clerical. And I love this because, you know, if you remember that 2017 incident when Senator Feinstein said during the hearings for then federal judge nominee Amy Coney Barrett, the dogma lives loudly within you and that's of concern. Now, some Catholics have turned the table on the insult and proudly proclaimed that the dogma lives loudly in me. <laughs> Praise and God. This, <laughs> yes, this reminds me of General Dissonese just laughing off the insult and being proud of it instead. Like, yep, mm -hmm. I'm clerical. Yep, the dogma lives loudly in me. We, and we can really there, relate to that. <laughs> that is absolutely living your faith unapologetically, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, very cool. good analogy. <laughs> um, Dissonese was eventually forced to choose between his career and his faith. Um, dissolution of religious organizations began in earnest during um, the Third Republic of France, which meant the beginning of the end for men of conscience like him. Uh, Dissonese could not assist in the expulsion of the religious. Uh, this is, you know, they were being driven out of their, their um, monasteries mm -hmm. um he, he he wrote the houses of the carmelites and franciscans had been attacked by 200 scoundrels at the head of whom sword in hand marched an artillery officer um he also shared another time about how another general had forbidden his officers to go to mass in uniform um he on the other hand fought for the right for his the, those men who were under him to even attend sunday mass um after an incident in which he would have been forced, had to force religious from the monasteries, he wrote, 
I thought that at the moment when amnesties are granted to the assassins and incendiaries of the commune, I could no longer remain at the head of troops liable to have to turn their bayonets against priests and to besiege monasteries. I imagine so, a lot of, I'm sorry, I, I just imagine no a lot of people today can really relate to this kind of struggle mm -hmm. uh, because there have been many efforts by individuals to tamp down on it, having any kind of religion uh, be known. And uh, what's unfortunate is that because these people are, um, you know, the Catholics, you know, the, the virtue that they're living, it is a gift to everybody around them rather than um, something to uh, cause trouble. Um, of course, if you're doing evil, <laughs> A virtuous man is trouble. So right, it's right. sort of Pontius Pilate all over again. <laughs> because for all for all those many years, um, the general was able to get along with all different sorts of people because he was living the Catholic faith, because he was a true Catholic, he could absolutely get along with the secular army, fellow army officers. He could get along with the Muslims when he was stationed in Algeria. He was able to be an advocate for, you know, the, the enlisted men who wanted to be able to attend mass. And it was not because he was compromising, but because of the fact that he was so Catholic that right. it, it sprang from that. Yeah. So you, you're seeing others as humans, not as black or white yeah. or this culture or that culture, but as humans, as God's children, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, unfortunately, he was eventually forced to choose between career and faith. Um, yeah, as we said, he, he was would have been required to assist in the expulsion of the religious. And so after this forced retirement, he was actually concerned that other Catholics would follow him out of the army, that here was this general who was such a good example. If he can't do it, I'm gone too. The thing is, he didn't want this. Um, he His quote was, he did not want the army to be thus deprived of the few Christians who remained among them. His, his thing was until your back is actually against the wall and you have to do something about, you know, that, that would choose, make you choose between breaking the faith or not, you absolutely should be out there. You should be in the arena of life because your presence as a Christian is essential. Absolutely. It's sort of like the uh, mustard seed. You need the mustard seeds so that they can grow and affect things for the positive. Yeah. 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 Um, so, yeah. So obviously he's an inspiration to us today because we're living in a time of secularization as well, as you mentioned, hostility towards the church. Right. Um, and I love these words of his because this is exactly what he would say to us today. He's going to mention France. You fill in the country of wherever it is that you're listening to this podcast episode. The Christians are given to the wild beasts. There is nothing new under the sun, but there will still be good days for the church. And God helping us, there will still be human lips to bear witness to this truth as long as there remains a little blood in the heart of France. And that's how applicable. Oh, boy. Right. So, yeah, his cause for canonization was introduced in 1928. There is a record of two incidents in which children recovered from near-death illnesses after prayers for his intercession. Um, as well, testimonies are still sent to the Bishop of Chartres in France, but other than that, his cause has not advanced. So it's up to us, guys. <laughs> yeah, I think it's because he's not very well known now. And so right. I'm glad, glad you're bringing him to the fore, Colleen. I know there is a, do you remember the title of the book that is out on him? I mean, it's hard to find, but um what's yes the there's one it's a it's a reprint of a very old book um that you can purchase it on amazon the life of general de Sonis from his papers and correspondence um it's part of the classic reprint series um that you can get uh easily online um people who can speak french there there is a book that was published in 2012 that tells that gives even better details i think than the older book um, I would love to see this published by ICS, but my translation skills are not up to the task. So I'll just have to pray that somebody will do that someday. So if there's anyone out there who's fluent, I've got a project for you. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're working on your French Colleen, because uh, I know there's a, another Carmelite. I know we're not going to talk about her today, but uh, 
Saint Mary of Jesus crucified. Her her writings are in French too. So I mean, once you get your French down, I mean, I'm anxious for you to share all the wealth yeah. of all the French <laughs> writings that we'd like to have in English. <laughs> so, there you go. But you know, uh, he is a great um, a great person to learn about, especially um, if you're in the military. And you know, we're all in the military in the sense that we're all doing spiritual warfare. And so the way yeah. he handles it has um, a lot of application to what we're going through in our lives today. So thank you for bringing him to the fore for us. And make sure everybody tune in when we do his more in-depth story, because we are going, we do have that yeah. in the works. We have a, we have a part two on this series and maybe a part three. We'll, we'll see. But I know for sure we're going to uh, have a conversation about him and you know a lot about him. So um, I'm really glad we're going to do that because we will, we want people to benefit from his life. And um, I know he will intercede for all of those who are in, in battle. So mm -hmm. thank you for bringing him our attention. Right. I am, I'm pleased to be able to do it. All right, so when we started this conversation, I promised that these Carmelites would be able to show by example how to live the faith courageously, even in opposition. So the commonality amongst everyone that we've discussed from St. Teresa and St. John down to uh, the general and Père Jacques is that they knew to put God first in their lives. They desired intimacy with him, and so their lives were a constant prayer. And this is what helped them to make the faithful choices even in the midst of the forces in opposition to the faith. Uh, St. Teresa Benedict of the Cross wrote, I need not worry about anything, but much prayer is necessary in order to remain faithful in all situations. Okay, we got to remember that. Much prayer is necessary in order to remain faithful mm -hmm. in all situations. So, um, yes, prayer is as essential as the air we breathe and the water we drink, indeed. Right. Right, because, you know, anything revolutionary that sprang from who they were as Catholics or as Carmelites, um, it, 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 it's their lives weren't any different from our own times, really. That quote that, um, you know, the general was, was, was quoting the Bible, there's nothing new under the sun. So, Ecclesiastes, yes, right? <laughs> it, it was as true when it was written in Ecclesiastes as it was... Um, when General de Sonis quoted it as it is about our own time today. There is nothing new under the sun. Um, they've been through it all before and they show us how to do it. So then specifically, what does this mean for us in the 21st century? Um, I'm going to offer a few suggestions, but then I leave it to you to think it over and come up with the specifics that fit your own life. All right, so let's go back again, a, a recap. St. Teresa, remember, she didn't fear the Inquisition. She knew that what she was writing was the truth and it was in line with the church. I would say our 21st century counterpart is, you know, woke culture and cancel culture being compared to the Inquisition. And, and I think that comparison is fair. Yeah. Um, today's Catholics have definitely felt the brunt of it. Just this past Lent, a few writers who are published by Tan Books were banned from selling on Facebook and Instagram because their topics, quote, didn't comply with commerce policies. Uh, policies that were never really explained to the banned authors, like what it was that they had done, but we know it was their, their Catholic topics. So even if it isn't something that we're writing that's causing trouble, we can support Catholic authors by purchasing their banned books. Um, know too that if you buy straight from Tan Books or Ignatius Press or ICS that more money ends up in the pocket of the Catholic publisher than you know just like purchasing it generically online. Yeah so it's important for us to stay in the truth like Teresa of Avila right. she really drove that point home right? Right so if it's not I mean it can literally be our voice that we're trying to get out there but if not we can ha certainly help support those who do have a louder voice than we might have. Um, St. John of the Cross, he held a love for the natural world that no amount of persecution or oppression could take from him. So I would say the modern counterpart to this would be, uh, you know, like just reading or watching or listening to the news can color the way you see the world and see our, our fellow inhabitants in this world. And I would say, don't let that happen to you, that if it's going to affect your spirit, and I know it does because friends and family members and I talk about this all the time. Just turn off the news. 
pray for the people who are either causing the misery or feeling the misery around the world, and then make an effort to see the beauty that is out there. Um, here in Ohio, we live in a climate of four seasons, so something marvelous is always going on outside. Today we and, had snow. Yes, today we part of April. snow in April. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah, April Fool. Oh. <laughs> yeah, right. It's um, beautiful. It's, it's a beautiful snow. <laughs> it is a beautiful snow, and you know, it's already the sun is shining on it. I think things will recover fine. <laughs> <laughs> but let's enjoy the moment. <laughs> Indeed. And you know, like I, I said, turn off the news, but no two that there is good online. People are still sharing photos of their gardens and their homes and their babies and their cupcakes and their breads. And you can choose to be a part of that too. Share your own or enjoy what other people are putting out there because there is absolutely beauty still being shared in the world. Um, yeah, that's good point. Very good point. And, and we do have God's beauty around us. But so many people I mean, we take it for granted and it's good to stop and, and be appreciative of all oh, that sunshine. It's so beautiful the way it's uh, making the, the leaves glisten and uh, just that whole thing. I, I just recently saw um, a video of the artist Akian. Uh, I don't know if I'm saying her name right, but she's a, a very gifted artist. And I just love that her artwork is always something uplifting and inspiring uh, mm -hmm. and, and pointing us to something good rather than, you know, something, you know, that, that makes us feel yucky. So um, yes, beauty in, in the world and in art uh, can do a lot to keep us um, uh, in peace. Because like you say, when, we, when you watch the news, you can lose your peace. And mm -hmm. so it's better to, to turn it off and, and maintain your peace, very important. Yeah. All right. Um, St. Teresa Benedict of the Cross and St. Maria Maravis, Maravillas, didn't let religious suppression keep them from their liturgical routines. Um, our modern counterpart, I think we've learned a great deal about how outside forces can interfere with our liturgical routines. Obviously not to the same extent of deportation or arrest as these saints experienced, but I think we've learned that flexibility and faithfulness can certainly embrace. You can be flexible to the situations that are around there and still be faithful at the at the same time in the way that you're able to do it. And the constant factor there, God. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> be and live and breathe in God. <laughs> All right, Père Jacques, he was removed from his position at the Carmelite School for Boys, but he never stopped being a shepherd of souls. They tried to stop him from that one thing, but he never did quit. He continued to serve people in the camps, whether that was as a priest or tending the sick in the infirmary. Our 21st century counterpart is that there are a few lessons to learn about this scenario, about living faith in the workplace. Um, the first lesson is that there are always ways to serve, even if your primary one has been taken from you. He was deprived of the thing he was very good at because of who he was, yet he still found ways to serve others. Uh, the second lesson is that there is nothing too unglamorous to be done for God. This man of a brilliant intellect still made the world a beautiful place by cleaning an infirmary by day and cleaning up after sick people by night. There's just everything. Nothing is, everything can be made for the glory of God and nothing is too demeaning for us at the same time. And when a soul loves self-sacrificial acts are the norm. You exactly. are thinking more about the other and how to make things better for the other than for yourself. And that's the way God is, so generous. And so he's always finding ways to help us grow and, and help us love, um, whether it's directly to him in prayer or through our service to others. Exactly, very beautiful. And finally, back to General Louis Gaston de Sunis, he never wavered from being true to the faith. Although he reached a point where he could not remain in his job, he told others that they should not quit merely because of oppression existed within the system. I would say that the 21st century version of that would be, don't go looking for fights. Outrage culture isn't one of these contemporary cultures we should aspire to either. Yes, there are real abuses and injustices happening around the world and at home. But even if there are real reasons to be offended by an insult to the faith or to the faithful, 
ask yourself what your most productive response should be. I'm pretty sure that our friend Louis Gaston would tell us to pray and to continue living our Catholic lives, not wallow in the injustice and, you know, stirring up those ill feelings that we were talking about from watching the news. You know, the, um, I don't know which psalm it is, the make justice your sacrifice and trust in the Lord um, just fits so perfectly in this situation. Right. Oh, so, boy. So uh, what do we have? Five or six Carmelites here or groups yeah. uh, that you have pointed out and so much for us to consider and to apply. That's the thing. If we just listen to this and do nothing with it, um, you know, it's just intellectual knowledge um but we want to apply this that's the important part how can we apply what we're learning here to our own lives and it's good for us to think about uh possible scenarios that we have been in or that we will be in or that we know that others have been in and how we might respond in a positive way that would um glorify the lord and love our neighbor absolutely so I told you I was going to lay it out at the beginning and I'll just repeat again what those things are that they're doing, how they showed courage in the face of opposition. They, they, they are, they remind us, put God first, that your prayer life is essential to you and that you should continue to live the faith unapologetically, no matter the situation. Um, the bottom line, when we're truly living the faith, they're really needn't be any difference interiorly whether things are good or bad exteriorly that's a really good point and one that we should really take to heart so um well colleen you've given us a lot to think about about how to exercise courage in the face of opposition and what our carmelites can teach us about living counterculturally i think that uh catholics today are having to choose whether they're going to live counterculturally or whether they're going to fall to um, the side of the secular world. So I think you've brought us um, much to consider, and I, I hope that people will um, apply it to their lives and arm themselves with these great spiritual weapons that uh, you've given to us through these Carmelite saints. Right. And, and I know we're going to continue. Yeah, I, was saying, I encourage everyone to look into each of these people, you know, a little bit more deeply, go ahead and go read up on them some more, because um, again, we just, we scratched the surface. You can look at how the whole of their lives is what contributed to, you know, their, their more moments of her heroism during um, their, their particular point of opposition to the faith. Um, yeah, just, just read, read them, read them all. They're great. <laughs> We always love the one we're reading too, don't we? Yes, <laughs> we love them all. How can we pick just one? Yeah. <laughs> and, and we love the general so much. I know you and I did a series on the general back in 2014, but unfortunately, uh, those uh, podcasts uh, somehow are missing. So uh, we hope to redo those at some point in time. But, but in addition to today's podcast, we are going to do another on the general you've agreed to do one on the general with me um, in this series of uh, courage in the face of opposition so uh, hopefully our listeners will uh, be interested in learning more about what the general has to teach us because there's yeah. so much um, so all right well thank you so much colleen you've given us a, a lot to consider uh, um, i'd like to close um now with um a prayer from St. Teresa of Avila. This comes from her um, letter number 40, um, which is one of the um, books from the ICS publications or her letters. And uh, this is a continuation um, from the opening prayer. Uh, so now you can see how she ends this prayer. I just love it that we've been given the actual prayers uh, Teresa, she wrote them down for us and so that we can pray in the spirit of St. Teresa of Avila um, to God. And so I just ask our, our listeners to get recollected now and to find uh, that still small space in your heart. Let's make it large, right? <laughs> A large space. <laughs> the center of your soul where God reigns. And let's approach him in prayer with Teresa. 
In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Oh, my Jesus, I will fight for you as long as I live, and love will be my sword. My weakness should never discourage me. When in the morning I feel no courage or strength for the practice of virtue, I must look upon this state as a grace. For you teach me that it is the very moment to put the axe to the root of the tree, counting only on your help. What merit would there be in fighting only when I feel courage? What does it matter even if I have none, provided that I act as if I had? Oh, Jesus, make me understand that if I feel too weak to pick up a bit of thread and yet do it for love of you, I shall gain much more merit than if I had performed some nobler act in a moment of fervor. So instead of grieving, I ought to rejoice seeing that you, by allowing me to feel my own weakness, give me an occasion of saving a greater number of souls. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, thank you again, Colleen, for joining me on Karma Light Conversations. And for our listeners, uh, thank you for tuning in. And we look forward to having another Karma Light Conversation very soon. God bless you.